How can we feel secure in a world troubled by earthquakes, tsunamis, famine, plagues, wars, disease, and natural disasters? If we unduly focus on all these things, we can lose sight as to who we are and what we are all about. Is there something constant that gives meaning and purpose to the world and our lives for that matter? St. Paul puts us on the right track when he said, here we have no lasting city, we seek the one to come. The city we seek is the city of God, the kingdom of God which we bless at the beginning of every divine liturgy, thereby proclaiming our citizenship in God's kingdom. The one who gives meaning, stability, security to us is the Lord Jesus Christ. For God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself. Thus, we give thanks to the Father who has qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He has delivered us from the power of darkness and conveyed us into the kingdom of the Son of his love, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins. Here we have no lasting city. We seek the one to come. Through Jesus Christ, let us continually offer God a sacrifice of praise that is the fruit of lips which acknowledges his name. What is the liturgy? What is the divine liturgy? How can we call it divine? Well, in order to understand the meaning of such terms, we really have to take a step back and return to the fundamentals, to the origins of Christian liturgy. Blessed be the kingdom of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever and ever. Amen. An image I like to use is one I'm sure that everyone has seen, the famous fresco in the Sistine Chapel that was completed by Michelangelo Buonarroti in the year 1513. What we see in that marvelous fresco of the creation of humankind is the outstretched hand of the creating God, the communicator of life, with his finger pointing and almost touching, but not quite, the outstretched finger of Adam, reaching out towards God to receive that sacred gift of creation of light. As I said, the two fingers are almost but not quite touching. And an image I like to use to describe what liturgy means is that liturgy is what fills that space between those two fingers. Because liturgy is really the celebration of that ever going creative redemptive, communicative work of Almighty God towards humankind. And the outstretched hand of Adam is the sign of humanity's receiving that gift and living according to it. That might seem to be an extraordinary claim for what we call liturgy. You might want to say, well, isn't liturgy what we do in church? Isn't liturgy our church services? How can one say that liturgy bridges that gap? Liturgy fills that division, that hole. It bridges that separation between God and humanity. And yet this isn't my idea. If we read the wonderful liturgical constitution of the Second Vatican Council, we see that in the second paragraph, the church makes what might seem at first glance an extraordinary claim for what liturgy is. The liturgy constitution says that it is through the liturgy that the work of our redemption is exercised. And that therefore the liturgy is where we truly see and express the true nature of the church. In other words, 
liturgy makes the church and the main thing that church does is liturgy because it is first and foremost that in the liturgy the church is what God truly meant the church to be. You have heard the church mentioned several times. When theologians refer to the church, they mean much more than the church building. Instead, they are referring to a structure of a different kind built in a unique way. As St. Peter tells us in his first letter, Come to Jesus Christ. He is the living stone that people have rejected, but which God has chosen and highly honored. Now you are living stones that are being used to build up a spiritual house. You are a group of holy priests, and with the help of Jesus Christ, you will offer sacrifices that please God. The scriptures say, once you were nobody, now you are God's people. At one time, no one had pity on you. Now God has treated you with kindness. So the church is people. In the words of the Second Vatican Council, the people of God. Let's move now to a more concrete example of which th what this can actually mean. I already mentioned that in the Byzantine liturgy we continue to baptize by immersion, which is a true representation of that Pauline theology of being buried to sin, dying to sin, to rise to new life in Christ. The same thing is true in our celebration of the Eucharist, which we call the divine liturgy because that is a coming together of the work of Christ continued in his church through our hands, through our voice. And in a fully decorated church where you have ranks and rows of saints rising up to God who is depicted in the dome in the form of the Pantocrata, the one who is the ruler of all, that is to say depicted as Christ, the glorified Christ, the ruler of the universe, Christ the King, as they call him in the Western tradition, you see the whole church militant and triumphant, the church militant, those alive in the nave worshiping, and then all of the ranks of the glorified saints rising up to Christ in the dome of the church, a visible presentation of what is not just a divine liturgy, but it's also our liturgy. That's what we see depicted here. In the iconostasis of the Byzantine church, the icon screen that divides the sanctuary from the nave of the church where the people participate in the liturgy, we see imaged forth the first level of symbolism of the Byzantine divine liturgy in which the sanctuary with its altar represents both the heavenly sanctuary where Jesus Christ, the glorified and risen Son of God, continues to offer his permanent self-offering before the throne of the Father. So the first level of reality is that we are dealing with an earthly representation of what is the heavenly liturgy. That is why in the Byzantine prayers, the earliest prayers of our divine liturgy, we refer to our participation, our concelebration with the angels who are chanting the glories of God with the Son of God before the throne of the Father. That's why we say that we represent the cherubim and we sing the thrice holy hymn to the life-giving trinity, that we lay aside the cares of this world in order to receive the king of all. Receive him when? In communion, of course. And so the liturgy opens with antiphons, which are reminiscent 
of the psalmody, the preaching, the prophecies of the old law, leading up to the coming of the word of God. And in the procession with the gospel book, where the priest and the service and the deacon come out from the furthest door and march through the church in procession, bearing the book of gospels, representing the fact that Christ first comes to us as incarnate word of God. But Christ came to us as incarnate word of God, not just in the incarnation, he comes to us at every moment of our existence in the preaching of his word through the church. And therefore this prophecy of the coming to us of the word of God will immediately be fulfilled in the proclamation of the scriptures and the preaching of the word of God. And then following the intercessions, we have what is called the great entrance or the major introit in which the priests and deacon accompanied by the acolytes and servers proceed through the church again, carrying from the altar of preparation the bread and wine prepared for the Eucharistic sacrifice. God, remember in his kingdom our holy universal pontiff, Benedict, our most blessed patriarch Lubomir, our most reverend archbishop metropolitan Stefan, every presbyter, deacon, monk, and nun, our nation under God, all those in the service of our country, the noble and ever memorable founders and benefactors of this holy church, and all you orthodox Christians, always, now, and forever, and unto ages of ages. Here again, this is an active prophecy that in the divine liturgy of the Eucharist, according to the symbolism of the Eastern Church, the sacrificed Christ will rise again, because what we receive in communion is of course not the body of a dead Christ. We receive in communion the living body of the risen Lord. And therefore, on this level of symbolism, which images forth the saving work of Christ, the altar symbolizes not just the heavenly altar, where the eternal sacrifice of Christ is constantly celebrated before the throne of the Father. It also symbolizes the tomb upon which the buried Christ was lain, only to come forth from the open doors of this tomb in order to bring salvation to the world symbolized by his resurrection. So the constant coming and going between the sanctuary and the altar and the people in the nave with the word of God, with the sacrifice of God's son, with the heavenly gifts of the risen Christ in the body and blood are a symbol of that constant commercium or economia, as the fathers of the church called it, that heavenly commerce, that heavenly activity, which I spoke of at the very beginning as filling that gap symbolically between the creating, redeeming hand of God and the receiving hand, the outstretched hand of Adam to receive that. This constant coming and going that we have in our divine liturgy is a very concrete and real symbol of that reality. And the figures of Christ himself, his blessed mother, the God bearer, the Theotokos, Bogoroditsa, pictured on the iconostasis, along with the vision of the apostles. The apostles are pictured on the doors. Why? Because it is through the doors that the word of God that they recorded in their, in their gospels, the evangelists, the four evangelists, take place. And very often, the scene also of the Annunciation is also depicted because the doors, the central doors, the holy doors, are the place of the announcement. 
They are the place from which the good news is always brought forth. A good news that began with the incarnation of Christ, which of course occurred at the Annunciation to Mary. Often we find the Last Supper depicted, the communion of the apostles, because what we do is the repetition of that exact same reality. We find deacons depicted on the doors because the deacons go in and out through those doors. We find the patron saints of the church because this is all a visible, concrete reality. It's not only the divine liturgy. It's not only the divine liturgy which comes out to us from this image of the heavenly sanctuary that we depict in our church, but it's also our liturgy. How do we become part of this church? Just as Christ is both human and divine, so too through our participation known as synergy in the great mysteries known in the West as sacraments of Christian initiation, that is baptism, chrismation, and communion, our human earthly identity is inseparably linked to the Trinity. Pope St. Leo the Great tells us that what was visible in our Redeemer has passed over into the mysteries. In the case of Christian initiation, the mysteries show us what Christ is doing in and for the church. When children are to be baptized, they are literally brought into the church building beginning in the narthex or entranceway, making their way to the tetrapod, which is a table where the mysteries are administered, and finally, right up to the sanctuary, the holy place, where Christ is just as present as he is in heaven at the right hand of the Father. Christ, by drawing individuals to himself, likewise, draws them into his church. Thus, the focus of the Christian life cannot be seen on the individual in isolation separated from others. Rather, for Catholics, the Christian life is about belonging. It is about an identity so tied to Christ and to others that separation is simply unthinkable. When we come together as church, we are assured of the presence of the one who promised. Where two or three are gathered in my name, I am in their midst. A visual representation of this presence can be seen in the sanctuary. Above and behind the altar table is an icon showing the Mother of God, who in iconography can be seen as a symbol of the church. She is pictured with the child Jesus in her womb. Mirroring the same reality is the tabernacle just beneath. The tabernacle looks exactly like the church building. The reserved sacrament within it again proclaims the truth of Christ's presence within the church. But Christ is just as present amid the people who come together for celebration of the divine liturgy within the church building. Christ is the bread of life, feeding the hungry people who come in search of nourishment. While on earth, Jesus miraculously fed the multitudes. Likewise, at the Last Supper, he also fed the apostles with miraculous food, his body and his blood. He continues to nourish with his body and his blood 
those who approach the table. But Jesus said that we are also nourished by every word that comes from the mouth of God. We are thus nourished at the table of his word as well. Christ nourishes us with the scripture proclaimed and preached at every liturgy. God has been present and active throughout the entire of our human history. The scriptures proclaimed within the liturgy testify to God's mighty deeds. Yet God's deeds are not relegated to the past, confined to ancient history. Rather, Christ's continued presence in the church assures us of that. For St. Paul, true Christian liturgy is what Christ did, lived out in our lives. Obviously, the divine liturgy represents the central act of our salvation in Christ. The paschal mystery of his dying and rising Jesus died on the cross some 2,000 years ago, and Christ definitively rose from the dead, never to die again. These once and for all events do not reoccur. Rather, the Word of God makes them present and available to us through the language of liturgy. Let us be attentive. At the Last Supper, Jesus himself gave us the key which would open to us the door of his sacrifice. During the meal, he took bread, blessed, broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Take this, he said. This is my body. He likewise took a cup of wine, gave thanks, and passed it to them, and they all drank from it. He said to them, This is my blood, the blood of the covenant, to be poured out on behalf of many. Jesus also tells us to do the same thing in memory of him. And so we do, using the words and actions of Jesus. On the night he was betrayed, or rather when he handed himself over for the life of the world, he took bread into his holy, most pure and spotless hands and gave thanks. He blessed the bread, sanctified and broke it, he gave it to his holy disciples and apostles, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you for the forgiveness of sins. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sin. The celebrant connects us into Christ's unique sacrifice. Perhaps the most dramatic gesture is the breaking of the large host, which we call the Lamb, as Jesus, the Lamb of God, was broken on the cross for our salvation, so does he bring that same salvation to our altar. As important as the sacrificial aspect of the divine liturgy may be, we cannot stop there. We must look deeper. After all, we do not just commemorate the dead Jesus hanging on the cross, rather, we celebrate the risen Christ who rose from the tomb and who lives still. The liturgy needs to make visible on our altar his living presence 
in our church. It is for this reason that the body and blood of Jesus, consecrated in the separate elements of bread and wine, as they were separated in his death on the cross, are once again reunited in the chalice. The Eucharistic elements are joined, offering us a great sign of the resurrection. It is in this form that we receive communion, thus bringing Christ's risen life into our own lives. Christ offered himself for our salvation. We celebrate that reality in our liturgies. But we celebrate that in our liturgies because that's supposed to be the image of what we are. It's the metaphor of what Christian life is. A metaphor which is not just an image but a reality in Christ. So when we leave the liturgical celebration, that's not the end of it. The liturgical celebration is simply the strengthening for what we're supposed to do. It's like breakfast. Breakfast is not the end of the day. You eat breakfast so you'll have some strength, some fuel, in order to go out and do your day's work. Liturgy is the same thing. The radical implication of Christ's life in us can be summed up in an amazing statement that comes down to us from the fathers of the church. God has become man so that man might become God. Yes, you heard that right. Eastern Christian theology boldly states that we are destined for divinization, theosis in Greek. Perhaps the simplest way to describe this great mystery would be by using another, more contemporary statement. You are what you eat. Eating is a particularly appropriate image since in the Divine Liturgy we are fed from two tables. The table of Christ's Word and the table of His body and blood. And if Christ is our food, then it follows that assimilation needs to take place. However, the transformation is an extraordinary one. In the case of ordinary food, the food is assimilated into us, becoming a part of our bodies. But in the case of Christ, assimilation goes in the other direction. We who eat are assimilated into the church, that is, into the body of the Christ who is our food. We become Christ for the world, destined to share the heavenly banquet prefigured in the Divine Liturgy. The reality of this transformation is underlined by the words of the Epiclesis. That is, the prayer in which the Holy Spirit is called down upon our Eucharistic celebration. The Spirit overshadows the earthly, which in turn is enabled to bring forth the divine. This is exactly what happened at the Annunciation, when the Holy Spirit overshadowed the Virgin Mary, thus making it possible for her to conceive the Son of God in her womb. And this is exactly what happens in the Divine Liturgy as well. The words speak for themselves. We ask, we pray, we entreat you. Send down your Holy Spirit upon us. 
upon these gifts presented here and make this bread the precious body of your Christ. And that which is in this chalice, the precious blood of your Christ. Changing them by your Holy Spirit. Well, this is all well and good in theory. But in real life, we know that much of the time, people are decidedly unchristlike. Isn't that what sin is all about? And where there is sin, there is need of forgiveness. Unfortunately, membership in the church does not exempt us from the weight of our baser nature. We fall into sin and we need to be forgiven. There are those sins which are so serious that they rupture our relationship with Christ and with the church. For forgiveness of these sins, which effectively put the sinner out of the church, sacramental reconciliation is required. However, not all sins break this relationship. Those sinners gathered within the church building, and which of us within the church is not a sinner, are invited to the table of the Lord. With faith and love and deep reverence for God approach. Where the Eucharist itself forgives sins. You don't believe it? Listen to the words pronounced over the communicant. The servant of God receives the precious body and blood of our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ for the remission of sin and unto life everlasting. Amen. Remission of sin and life everlasting. The one is a necessary precondition for the other. By dying, Jesus saved us from the death of sin. By rising, Christ destines us to share the life of the eternal God. All of this is made present and available to us in the Divine Liturgy when, as Church, we celebrate the Eucharist. What can our response be but one of thanks? In fact, the word Eucharist itself comes from the Greek word for thanksgiving. Our celebration of the Eucharist is also our supreme act of thanksgiving to God for all that is given to us in the Divine Liturgy. The hymn after the communion expresses this very lyrically. Jesus tells us, what you have received as a gift, give as a gift. This is not just a quaint statement. It is a command. In the Divine Liturgy, we receive the greatest of all possible gifts, 
a participation in the very life of God. This gift is not only for us. Rather, it is meant to be shared by us with all that we meet. In a sense, we are like leaven or yeast, which is a live culture. When mixed with the inert dough, the yeast reacts with the mixture and causes the whole thing to rise. When we are sent forth, we are to bring the divine life into the society and culture which surround us, touching it and changing it as we have been touched and changed. We who have been fed and forgiven and healed and united in Christ need to bring these same gifts to a world so desperately in need of them. When the celebration tells us to go forth in peace, we answer in the name of the Lord. In so doing, we show that we understand our task. While we live, everything that we do is done in the name of the Lord. So, Come and see how good the Lord is. Come and hear the word of God proclaimed. Come and taste the heavenly kingdom. Come and be filled with the life of the Trinity. Peace be with all of you. Come and be transformed by the Holy Spirit so that you can go forth and transform the world in the name of the Lord.